Good morning, Wabash. Today, speaking at Pioneer Chapel, will be Ben Stokowski, Joe House, Ian Finley, and Ahad Khan. I will read off their bios in the order they will be speaking. Ben is a history major with a minor in biology from Evansville, Indiana. At Wabash, he was a four-year letterman and captain of the basketball team, a CIB partner, a freshman orientation mentor, and was the IMA treasurer. After graduation, Ben will travel to Europe for two weeks with his roommates, the Gator Boys, before heading north to Notre Dame for graduate school, where he will pursue a master's through the ESTEEM program. Joe is a senior econ major from Lafayette, Indiana. He is currently a captain on the baseball team and brother of Lambda Chi Alpha. Joe is a member of the Sphinx Club and served as a freshman orientation mentor. Joe has accepted a position with Teach for America and will be teaching seventh grade math at T.C. Howe Community School in Indianapolis this coming fall. Ian is a senior from Carmel, Indiana. At Wabash, he has been active participant in a variety of clubs, including College Mentors for Kids and Cycling Club. With the help of the programs and support that Wabash provides, he has had the chance to meet people in the Crawfordsville community at the Montgomery County Free Clinic, around the world through immersion classes, across rows of computers at the Lilly Library, and right next door from his room at Beta Theta Pi, where he has recently begun hosting a weekly record night. After commencement, he plans to accept the Fulbright Award to teach in Spain. Ahad was born in Lahore, Pakistan, but lived in four different cities across the country before coming to the United States to attend Wabash. Here, he majored in political science and minored in religion. He serves as a peer career advisor at Career Services and a democracy fellow with the Wabash Democracy and Public, Public Discourse Initiative. He has also worked with The Bachelor, Student Senate, and the Pre-Law Society. For Ahad, aside from Hoosier hospitality, the best things about America are root beer and religious freedom. After commencement, he'll be working as an analyst with Goldman Sachs in Dallas, Texas. Please welcome our senior chapel speakers. Thank you, thank you. Um, good morning, Wabash. Good morning. I was wondering what you guys were gonna call me, Ben or Stack, so Stack's cool, but. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Sphinx Club for giving me this opportunity. Uh, this, this is awesome. I'm, I'm really humbled. Um, I'm also really humbled to be up here with these three very decorated, impressive colleagues of mine. Uh, as you can tell, I, I might feel, I'm a little nervous, but uh, I've never given a speech like this in front of so many people. Uh, and I never took Rhetoric 101, so sorry, Rhetoric professors. <laughs> really a rhetoric class at all, so. Uh, I tried to psych myself up. I thought this was... Uh, I sing karaoke at the China Inn sometimes on Thursday yeah. nights. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen me do my thing with uh, T. Wade or, or, or Duncan or, or Drew Fleming singing Party in the USA. But uh, yeah, this, the, the $5 pictures really help with that, just to say, just to say the least. Um, but really, I'm up here. I want to reflect on my Wabash career uh, and give a little bit of advice. A little bit of advice. Uh, first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself why I came to Wabash, uh, and then get into a take-home message. Uh, many that know me know that I'm pretty laid back. That is, when Michigan State's not making a Final Four run, or the Cubs are in the playoffs. Uh, I'm sure Dean Raiders uh, feels my pain on that one. Uh, I'm pretty family-oriented. Uh, I enjoy watching baseball with my dad, or just drinking margaritas with my mom and talking about life. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a nerd. I like to get things done. Yes, I have my senior checklist already completed. Uh, and I can spend hours on end at the library. And I love sports, watching them, playing them, really anything to do with them, I love it. So when looking for a college, I looked for one that had these qualities, among other things. So why did I come to Wabash? I never heard of it until my US history teacher, Mr. Mattingly, whose son went here, told me about it. He said that I reminded him a lot of a Wabash man. I didn't really know what that meant, but I wanted to check it out. Uh, so I came on a visit. It was the week after the bell game, and Fabian, as many of the seniors probably had, was their tour guide. Um, so my first class, I, w I went to a class, I went to a video game class taught by Professor Abbott. 
Ironically enough, I am in a video, video game class right now, and we have Game Jam from 4.15 to 6 in the basement of the library, so I hope to see everyone there. <laughs> but uh, whenever I walked into the class, everyone had mohawks and pajama pants on. So I thought, you know what, this place is pretty laid back. Good, good first impression. Then after the class, two students came up to me and asked me how I liked the visit and if, if they could reach out to me or if I could reach out to them if I had any questions. I thought that was pretty nice. Um, and then everyone on the mall was nice, holding, holding doors for one another and just being super nice to one another, conversing. I could tell this place was a little bit different. I like the family atmosphere. And there was a lot of talk of the workload, and I know that maybe scares some of you, but I like to be challenged in my classes, so I thought that was cool as well. And it's all guys, so the whole sports thing I think I'd be, I'll be all right with. So I decided to come here. My freshman year, I was excited, but a little bit nervous. I had my normal moving away from home struggles. I live in Evansville, so I'm about three hours away. Actually, a different time zone, so that was something to get used to. But I made instant friends with the basketball team and all my college hall homies. I see you guys out there. But uh, I put a lot of internal pressure on myself once classes started up. I wanted to get involved. I wanted to do well in basketball. I wasn't being the person that I described above, and I didn't like that. I thought that reason was Wabash, and I wanted to transfer. So going into my spring break, my freshman year, I went back to my high school memorial. I know, cut the cord, cut the cord. But um, I went to go see Mr. Mattingly, who told me about Wabash. It's a Catholic high school, so we pray before all of our classes. And he always ends his prayers with, be thankful for where you're at, what you're doing, and those you're doing it with. I wanted to talk, talk to him a little bit about my struggles, but as soon as he saw me in the doorway, he started talking about Wabash, hyping up the education, how it was awesome that I was playing sports, how proud he was of me and his son that went here, and how many great dudes at Wabash there are. At that moment, I realized all this internal pressure wasn't allowing me to see the great opportunities I had. I decided to stick it out. The next three years flew by. I embraced the grind and I got back to being me. Not to say it wasn't easy. I had many long nights in the library. I had wrist and foot surgeries and I changed my major. But what had changed is I looked at every opportunity as a chance to better myself, cherish the friendships I was making. Now I get to reflect. I get to look back and see that Wabash College is like a four-year pledge ship to earn a coveted sheepskin diploma. Through the ups and downs, you learn to embrace the grind and learn to be thankful for what you have been given. These things are like the professors that want to see you grow. For me, that was specifically Dr. Warner, Dr. Ingram, and Dr. Pittard. The Wabash Mafia willing to give you advice and opportunities like Roland Moore in the Career Services and just having lunch with Tyler Wade on Tuesdays. I also like the friendly faculty like Sherry Ross and Mama Sue, the paid internships, the many sports and clubs to participate in, and the leadership opportunities. Also, the intramurals. Shout out to the bench warmers. We got a big championship game in softball today, so hope to see you guys out there on the turf field, 645. <laughs> uh, but most importantly, the friends who are genuinely good people like the basketball team, the 227, the Gator Boys, and many more countless people that make this place so special. It's not the many chapters of reading or the many pages that I've written that I will remember, but the brotherhood that I have experienced, the lifelong friends that I have made. I'll even miss people just saying hey on the mall and calling me by name. I'll miss Lucas Bucina, my freshman roommate, yelling, roommate, or boys, how we doing? <laughs> I love you, Butch Buddy. I look out in the crowd and see a lot of faces that I know would go to battle with me. I know a lot of people would help me out if I needed it. And I also see some guys out there that would like to drink at the cactus tonight. So in closing, I'd like to read this quote from the New York Times called Wealthy, Successful, and Miserable. It states, the smoothest life paths sometimes fail to teach us about what really brings us satisfaction day to day. Wabash has taught me that running from fears and struggles never allows you to grow and move past them. Although not the smoothest path, I'm glad I stuck it out freshman year. I'm grateful for the obstacles that Wabash put in front of me because it made me who I am today without changing the good qualities of who I was before. Wabash is not for everyone, and no one said it would be easy. But whenever you are struggling here, and trust me, everyone does, take the opportunity to be thankful for the opportunities you've been given, the people in your life that have helped you get this far, and the people in your life right now. Or in other words, learn to be thankful for where you're at, what you're doing, and those you're doing it with. Thank you.
Good morning, Wabash. Gosh, that's cool. Um, all right, Senior Chapel 2019, oh dear. Um, first, I have to start out with some thank yous. I actually have a list of groups that have been incredibly supportive for me my entire time here at Wabash. First, my parents who made the trip here from Lafayette this morning, they're in the back. Thank you guys for being so supportive for me and anything I do, athletics, academics. Um, you guys truly mean the world to me, and I can't thank you enough. Uh, next, thank you to the Sphinx Club for allowing me to speak today. Uh, it's truly an honor, um, and I do not take it lightly, and it's an experience that I am sure I'll never forget, so thank you guys. Uh, next, I'd like to thank my baseball family. Um, thank you guys for supporting me both on and off the field. Uh, it's been an incredible four years. Um, we're definitely not done yet. Next, the Lambda Kai House. Uh, Thank you guys for living with me through my ups and downs every day and being a place that really cares about me. To the professors that I've had here at Wabash, especially the Econ and Education Department, thank you guys for pushing me and preparing me for my life after Wabash. And finally, for the Wabash Center staff, one, thank you for hiring me two years ago, and then also thank you for me for being a family that supports me here at school. All right, so those are my thanks. And now I actually feel the need to give an apology because if you didn't know, last semester, Keith Owen and I were the chapel coordinators. And so most of, most of what we did was recruit people to come up here and speak. Um, and that involved a little bit of pressuring people to speak sometimes. And I didn't realize until I was writing a speech that it's actually a very difficult task and is currently causing me to become incredibly nervous. So <laughs> if I force someone to come up here and speak and it caused them lots of anxiety and scarred them, I'm very sorry. <laughs> So this talk, I want to share with you something that I believe that I've gotten figured out. It's what fuels me in a lot of ways, and I hope it will speak with you and just maybe leave a mark on your life. All right, so here it goes. I want to talk to you today about a word, and this is a word that I frequently use in my papers here at Wabash because I'm not sure if I should really be using the word effect or affect most of the time, so I play it safe, and I use this word, impact. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Um, so I've learned a lot here in my time at Wabash. I could, I could tell you how to interpret some economic data. I could rattle off some facts about Nat Latin America. After this semester, I can tell you all you need to know, know about major and minor musical skills. Um, but what, I th what I've learned here at Wabash that I believe matters the most is that it is greater to be successful in our impact that we have on others than to be successful in terms of dollars and our social rank. That's really like my main point. I believe we should not be seeking a life that will maximize our bank accounts, but instead I believe we should be striving for a life that will maximize our impact on others. Now I know that sounds cliche, but I believe if our goals and ambitions are wrapped up in dollar signs and earning prestigious titles, then I think we're missing the point. And here's why. If our goals are motivated by money or having some sort of well-respected title, then our goals will ultimately end with us. The way I see it, if we have this self-centered way of, of viewing success, we'll go through our entire lives on earth existing for ourselves, and in the end, what will it all be for? And I don't know about you, but I want to matter. I want to leave my mark on this world by having a lasting impact on the people around me. I often say that here at Wabash we have a lot of studs. Studs isn't guys who are just flat out good at whatever they do. Studs who are go-getters who have the ability to go out into the world and make a huge impact. The ability to inspire, create, teach, help, and ultimately make a difference in the world. And I truly believe that if all you studs out there are motivated by making an impact and not just making a buck, then I think we have a real shot as a college to be truly successful. And I want to clarify something here. Uh, I'm not saying don't become a doctor because then you'll make a lot of money and have a prestigious title, because we definitely need really good doctors out there who make an impact. And down the road someday when I'm going to need some sort of surgery and I'm laying on the table, I'm hoping one of you guys are out there ready to cut me open. 
And I hope you're good. <laughs> but if you're planning to become a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer at some big law firm or some career path that will give you wealth and a title, I encourage you to look in the mirror and ask yourself if you're taking that path because you truly want to make an impact on the people you'll be serving or if, in fact, you're just chasing the money and the highly respected title. Because when I came to Wabash as a freshman, I wanted to be a doctor, and it was 100% for the wrong reasons. Partly because I wanted to be Dr. House, like the TV show. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> but truly, deep down, I wanted to have a high salary. And I wanted people to say, oh, Joe House, he's a doctor. He's made it. And I think if someone's going to be a doctor, they absolutely cannot have those motives. Instead, we need doctors who desire to heal and help, not for their own benefit, but for their patients. And it's funny how I've grown in this kind of thought, too. Um, at that same time when I was a freshman, uh, I actually used to poke fun at my brother, who was pursuing to be a teacher when he graduated college. And I would tell him that when I graduated college, I was going to be making so much more money than him. Interestingly, he probably had already figured out this lesson that I'm telling you about today. Funny how things change, right? <laughs> so here's what I think. If you're sitting out there and you have a question in the back of your mind about what you're going to do with your life, I encourage you to pursue a life that will allow you to lead the big, leave the biggest impact on the people around you and ultimately the world. Uh, and that leads me to a last point about impact, and that's how one person can have an impact on such a huge world. And to illustrate this, I'm actually going to steal a story that Hank Horner told on this stage last year during his senior travel talk, because if I've learned anything at Wabash, it's that if Hank Horner did something, it was probably good. <laughs> so Hank said, he, uh, he told a story and he described this man who truly did want to make an impact. He wanted to change the world. And as the man grew up, he found that changing the world uh, was difficult. And so he said, okay, I'm just going to try and change the nation. And as time went on, he found that that was difficult and overwhelming too. So he said, okay, I'm just going to try and change my state. And as time went on, that, found, that was found to be too hard too. So he said, okay, I'll try and change my town now. And time continued to go on, and he could not change his town. So he said, okay, let me try and change my family now. And by that time, his kids had already grown up and were set on their ways. So he could not change his family. So at that time, he said to himself, wow, I guess the only person I can really change is myself. And then after some reflection, the man realized that if he would have initially changed himself, then he could have had an impact on his family. And his family could have impacted their town. The town, the state, the state could have had an impact on the nation. And then really that man could have had an impact on the entire world. So to make an impact, you don't have to do, go out and do something crazy or have any sort of particular career. We can have an impact every single day with our actions and our words in the lives of people around us. So Wabash, I ask you to think about your motives in life. And I challenge you to make your motivation impact. Thank you. Good morning, Wabash. Good morning. That really is cool, Joe. <laughs> um, well, hello. First off, I'd like to thank, thank the Sphinx Club uh, for allowing me to talk today. Uh, I'd like to thank all you guys for attending. Uh, I know it's a very busy time of the year, and it means a lot to my fellow presenters and me that you'll take time out of your busy schedule to, uh, to listen to us and hear what we have to say. Um, on the topic of saying stuff, uh, I'm pretty scared of giving speech speeches, which is good, because that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, I think a lot of it comes from the fact that when I was growing up, I had a bit of a speech impediment, like very, very small. I, I uh, confused my R's and my laterals. Quick shout out to Dr. Hardy's linguistics class. And uh, I wasn't able to say my SH sounds, like the shh, uh, to the point where I had to avoid saying people's last names. Uh, I'd be like, he was just Joe, he wasn't Joe Shelley. Um, it even got to the point where people spread a rumor that I had an Irish accent in middle school. 
which I didn't, I didn't deny. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Uh, and when I was very little, I actually went to speech school, which I mistakenly called peach school. Uh, and I think, while well, that's adorable, it's uh, how you really know that you do have a speech impediment when you can't... <laughs> you can't pronounce the name of the place where you go and get that fixed. Um, but, uh, but luckily for me, giving a speech wasn't a prerequisite for experiencing the Wabash community. Uh, in fact, I've been coming to Wabash for as long as I can remember with my, uh, my family, my dad in particular, uh, who was an alumnus of the class of 1983. Uh, and I have very fond memories of coming out to at least one football game a year, usually uh, homecoming or Ramon on Bell, and just kind of meet, weaving my way through the shell gates, being offered more hot dogs than I can eat. Um, and aside from being generous with their food, Wabash alums have always been very generous just in general. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting many alums through my dad, uh, and many, at that point, future alums through my brother, class of uh, 2015, Ben Finley, uh, when he was here at Wabash and I was visiting, trying to decide where I wanted to go to school. Uh, whenever people ask me why I went to Wabash, even today, the community that I'd seen my whole life was the top reason I always stated. Uh, just seeing this group of people, seeing the amazing people they, they come to be, and kind of the formation they have at Wabash was always just top notch and something that I really, really wanted to experience. Uh, Unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, in the last year and a half, I've really begun to know the strength of the Wabash community. In December of 2017, my, fa my father unfortunately passed away. Uh, it was a very trying time for my family and me. Uh, one thing I noticed in the last year and a half is that it is in these trying times that people truly show their strength. And the Wabash community came out strong in their support of my family and me across generations of Wabash men uh, both immediately following his death and up to the day. Uh, a strange thing for me in my experience was the fact that um, about a week after the funeral, uh, I was on a plane to Spain, uh, which is a very different place than where I was in Indiana. And uh, outside of the program's directors and my host mother, um, I didn't really tell anyone about the Regent's tra tragedy. I was, I was happy to live a uh, quote-unquote normal life, and it just was good to kind of have that. Uh, but luckily, I still have support from home, from my, from my mother, who's in the back filming me right now. Hello. Uh, uh, my brother, who's sitting back there with his former professor, Dr. Rogers. Uh, my other brothers, and then just many others, uh, who just, at the very least, just send out texts throughout the year. Uh, but also, I was lucky enough to be there with two of my pledge brothers, uh, Joel Janak and um, Evan Hansen, both of whom knew what I was going through and were tremendous supporters. Uh, Evan especially was a great supporter, and along with sharing many adventures. Uh, <laughs> it, would, it would be a different chapel talk. Um, <laughs> would routinely check in with me, uh, getting coffee, asking how I was doing, uh, and just providing some space to talk, because that's just the kind of friend he was. As we all know, Evan passed away this year, bringing about a lot of pain and confusion uh, for those of us who are left missing such a great friend. But that being said, once again, the Wabash community came in strong and came together during that time. And it's, it's impressive, guys. It's incredible. The amount of just love and support I've seen on campus for everyone involved has just been incredible. And they offered the love and support that Evan had offered me during my time of grief and would have really made him proud. And for everyone in here, whether you're about to graduate or not, I just want to offer you a thank you for being part of that community, as well as a challenge to keep that community strong. Never be afraid to love and support the other members of the Wabash community. And also never be afraid to ask for that love and support even after their time on campus is done. To, to conclude, I want to state that in my mind over the last year and a half, the ever repeated mantra of Wabash, Wabash always fights, always has a bit of an implicit addition at the end that I don't say, but uh, I always say in my head, and that is Wabash always fights together. Thank you.
Good morning, Wabash. Good morning, Firstly, let me be clear that I will not be talking about root beer. <laughs> I will, however, share my experiences of Who's Your Hospitality and will also discuss religious freedom in America, as it is hard to think of anything outside the scope of the First Amendment. But before that, I thank Clark and the Sphinx Club for this opportunity. I'm deeply honored to participate in this Wabash tradition. When I received the invitation email from Clark, I felt great, only momentarily though, because I soon realized that I do not know the second verse of Old Wabash. <laughs> it's, it's all right, uh, because since then, I have spent more time memorizing the song than working on the speech and pre or preparing for my finals. <laughs> Today I will share my experiences at Wabash outside academics on how the support from all of you made this place a home for me and that we should ensure the same for every person who becomes a part of our Wabash community. Coming to the United States was an exciting yet nerve-wracking experience as my international brothers and those of you who have studied abroad can agree entering a new culture can be intimidating. Here at Wabash I noticed something unusual the Wabash community was as excited to learn about me and my experiences as I was to learn about the United States. Sharing about my Pakistani identity made me feel proud of my country and culture, as many American friends on campus had never met a Pakistani student before. The hardest thing was to clarify that Pakistan was in South Asia and not the Middle East. <clears throat> my American brothers always appreciated this minor correction. I would tell them that it's okay, because before coming to Wabash, I also didn't know where Indiana existed on the US map. <laughs> <clears throat> Alongside these cultural experiences, I also began to share my religious beliefs, because many peers had never met a Muslim student before. This was an unusual experience, because growing up, I could never share my religious experiences with anybody in Pakistan. Not because I was ashamed of my beliefs, but because the Pakistani constitution declares the sect of Islam that I belong to as non-Muslim. I belong to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. My community is not recognized because of our doctrinal differences with the Orthodox Sunni and Shia sects. Because of my religion, I cannot vote in my own country, and my state-issued passport bars me from traveling to certain places as it mentions my religion. I cannot visit Mecca and perform the pilgrimage, which is a religious obligation for every able-bodied Muslim. All government-issued documents, including my national ID, mentioned religion as a way for the state to effectively identify and discriminate against the Ahmadiyya community. The successive governments of Pakistan have introduced laws that go beyond the constitutional discrimination against Ahmadis. Pakistan's penal code explicitly states that no member of the Ahmadiyya faith can pose as a Muslim. I often wonder what posing as a Muslim looks like. Is it growing a beard, or saying the Islamic greeting of peace be on you, or reciting the Holy Quran? Under the law, I cannot do any of those things in public. Doing so can lead to criminal prosecution under the penal code's provisions. This can be a fine or imprisonment for up to three years, and in worst cases, it may even lead to charges of blasphemy, a crime punishable by death under Pakistan's infamous blasphemy law. In fact, in 2017, a Pakistani court sentenced three men of the Ahmadiyya faith to death for the crime of blasphemy. This year, an 85-year-old man from my community was finally released after four years in jail for the crime of selling copies of the Holy Quran. In 2010, I lost an uncle and many friends when a terrorist attack on an Ahmadi mosque killed over 90 people as they offered Friday prayers. My cousin was paralyzed and my brother-in-law also sustained injuries as a result of that attack. Because of all these reasons, I never openly declared my faith to anyone until I came to Wabash. After coming here and discussing my beliefs, I developed a tremendous respect for my newfound community. I received respect from all for who I was and did not have to hide any part of my personality. On this campus, I felt safe as those around me were willing to listen to me. This showed me a beautiful side of humanity that I had not seen before. 
Upon seeing the deteriorating condition for Ahmadis in Pakistan, I decided to apply for asylum in the United States. Not knowing anything about the process, and certainly not having any money to pay an attorney, I sought help from Wabash. I received overwhelming support from the college. Our international programs director, Amy Weir, spent an entire month with me to prepare my application. The US government officials, with whom I interacted during my asylum process, were respectful and showed a caring attitude. Not only that, but after my interview, the asylum officer shared some tips with me on preparing for law school and how some years there can be more boring than others. <laughs> Through these experiences, both on and off campus, I comprehended the meaning of liberty and justice for all. I thought to myself that regardless of what the president might think about immigrants and Muslims, there are many more Americans willing to uphold freedom for everyone alike. <clears throat> In 2017, when I could not travel to an immersion trip to Europe with my class because of President Trump's travel ban, I received similar support from the Wabash community. When that happened, I thought that I was in a weird spot. Being a non-Muslim in Pakistan was dangerous for me, and now being a Muslim in America was also causing troubles. <laughs> What's better, though, is that this spring break, I got to go on that same immersion trip. Through sharing these experiences, I want to ensure that just like this campus and this country protected me, each person who becomes a part of our Wabash Brotherhood feels the same. As students, we must listen and learn about the various backgrounds of one another. This not only enriches our college experience, but makes all of us more humane individuals. Not being able to go back to my home country for the fear of losing life is an inexplicable feeling. Pakistan will always be home, and I want to end my country's baseless discriminatory laws. I believe that perhaps a rigorous liberal arts education can provide a remedy against Pakistan's current predicament. The youth there are eager to learn about the world, however, they often lack access to avenues that provide such opportunities. Pakistan's population is over 200 million, and its literacy rate hovers below 60%. Two-thirds of the country's population is below the age of 30. Only a proper education system can save Pakistan. Instead of supplying arms and ammunition, the international community should empower the educational sector there. I say this because I have benefited from a community like Wabash, where professors and staff care deeply about students. All young people should have access to mentors who care for them. Over the course of four years, I have received support from many faculty, staff, and student members of the Wabash community. I would be amiss not to share with you the names of those who have had the greatest impact on me. Professor Scott Hemsel, Dr. David Blix, Dr. Sarah Drury, Amy Weir, and Cassie Hagen, I'm thankful to each one of you for all that you have done for me during my time at Wabash. I'm thankful to my roommate Dominic and his parents and my host parents for their continued support. Of course, I'm also thankful to my parents and my sisters who instilled in me an appreciation for the American sense of humor and supported me in studying something other than STEM. <laughs> Finally, my deepest thanks to the class of 2019 for showing me every day what constitutes brotherhood. Without your support, friendship, and care, my college experience would not have been the same. Together, let us never forget the impact of our Wabash education and make sure that many who follow benefit from this institution the same way as we have. With that, I thank you all, and Wabash always fights.